Good morning. It all started in a garden. After God created all of creation, he placed humans, his crown jewel of creation, he placed them in the garden. And it was in that garden that God gave dominion to humanity. He said, all of this, all this is yours. Name the animals, whatever you like. Eat from all the trees and the plants, except for this one tree. And the garden was where man was given his bride. It was in that gift that God proclaimed that man shouldn't be alone. It was in the garden where God enjoyed community with humans and all was the way that it was supposed to be. Then curiosity. Curiosity caused humanity to doubt the goodness of God. The devil played on that curiosity of humanity and, and finally the curiosity peaked and the first couple disobeyed God. As a result, they were exiled from the garden. As a result, sin entered the world. And the story of humanity is us striving with all our might to get back to the garden. The story from then on is us, is people trying to get that community back with God. Deep down, every person, every human is longing for what was lost that day. And we try to fill the void with other things. We try to fill it with pleasure, achievement, relationship, drink, anything really. We're all trying to get back. But the Christian is the one who's on their way back. We're in a series called Reborn. And this series, it's, it's really like a foundations thing for, for new believers. So if, if you've come to faith, the series outlines the aspects of what it means to be a new believer. But really it's, it's outlining what it means to have the gospel, all the benefits of the gospel. And today we're going to talk about our new destination, where the Christian is headed. Our scripture today is based on John's prophetic visions of heaven. When John, the apostle who walked with Jesus, the one who wrote the gospel of John, was older in life, they tried to execute him for being a believer of Jesus. They tried to boil him alive, and it didn't work. That's a bad day, all right? And so he survived that, and so they said to him, well, you won't die, so we're gonna exile you to a prison work island. It was called Patmos at the time. Today it's called Crete in the region of Greece. And as the old apostle, the end of his life was doing prison work on this island, God gave him a prophetic vision of the future. And God gave him a prophetic vision of heaven. And that's where we'll be this morning. This morning's scripture is Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21 is where we are this morning, if you're following along. And this is where we'll stay, because this has all we need to talk about the, the Christian's new destination. So let me read it for you. Revelation 21, one through six. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. 
He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Also he said this, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without repayment. Word of the Lord. And our first point in our new destination, if you're a Christian, you have a new destination, and your new destination is home. Your new destination is home. I'm going to go back to that scripture, verses 1 and 2. Saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first had passed away, and the sea was no more. Saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down. Hear how Jesus says it in John's account. When Jesus has already pre- uh, predicted his betrayal, he says these words to comfort his disciples in John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. The Christian is headed to a new destination. That destination is a physical place where you will spend eternity. There are different words to describe this place. Paradise, the afterlife, in glory, The Bible calls this place heaven. And the word heaven is used 276 times in the New Testament. And our first truth is that this is a physical place. It'll be a home. It'll be your home. This is important. This is important because I know in in a room like this with with an audience online, we have a wide range of people. Some of you have great homes. Some of you have fantastic homes. You're blessed. But some of you, some of you do not have a home. And so we have this wide spectrum of people. By the time I was in high school, I moved 11 times. And I I remember thinking as a child who kept getting uprooted and moving to, to new cities, to new schools, I just want a steady home. I just want a steady place to set down roots, which is why I worked so hard to get my kids that life. I I, I wanted them to have the roots, what I what I didn't have. Some of you feel the same way. You just want a home. Let me tell you, if you're in Christ, you will have a home. And your home will be in heaven with God. And believe me, if it's in heaven with God, that's a stable home. In Revelation 21, as we continue, John talks about this literal place. And he tries to talk about it as someone who is a working class person in their life. Like this wasn't a professor. Like this isn't Paul, right? This isn't Ivy League scholar Paul. This is a working class apostle. And he's trying to describe the wonders of heaven in his working class words. So this is what he says. It had a great high wall with 12 great gates and the, and the gates, 12 angels and the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the son of Israel were inscribed. And then he goes on. When he measured it, he found it was a square as wide as it was long. In fact, its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles. Both John's account and Jesus' account describe a literal place. And this place would have been similar to the houses they knew at the time. These houses that were inside a fortified city with fortified city walls. 
And they're describing these literal places where the Christian will spend their eternity. And I wanna tell you something. These homes in these fortified cities are given to the Christian freely. Um, there are a lot of like moguls, there are a lot of entrepreneurs, there are a lot of celebrities and athletes who, who become rich, affluent, right? And they do this wonderful thing. They, 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 um, they take a loved one. There was a, a former NFL player, he used to uh, take single moms and give them homes. And if you've ever seen, I've seen videos of somebody just handing a home to a family member or to a loved one, like they, they pull up and they go like, isn't this a cool house? And they go, yeah, that's cool, like, wow. And then they hand him the keys, like Dwayne The Rock Johnson, like with his giant hand, hands his mom the keys, right? And he goes, it's your home. And they go, what? Stop it. And then they, and, and then they go in denial. And then they start negotiating. And then it's like the stages of grief, but it's like, it's an awe and amazement. Like, you're giving this to me? That's how we'll react in the new heaven and the new earth. When each Christian is handed by the living God their own dwelling place, it'll be above our understanding. It'll be amazing. So the first truth is that heaven is a real, literal destination. And so you're, you're thinking to yourself, but, but Edmund, I thought heaven was a spiritual place. Anyone ever heard that? It's a spiritual realm. And, and, okay, so this is where we can figure this out with the scholars. I might be wrong, but I believe that's what it is right now. Right now it's a spiritual place where those who are in faith are with God forever, spiritually. But, but the Bible talks about, and read 1 Corinthians 15, 42, for more info on this, a, a literal resurrection and, and the new heaven and the new earth are literal places. So there will be a day when judgment happens, when, when, when this world is rebooted, that there will be a physical place. So if it's a spiritual state, it's that now. But there will be a day for resurrection and physical. I hope that helps all five of you who are interested in that. <laughs> so your destination is home. It's a physical place. It's not just spiritual. You will live there with your new body. But you're not just headed home. Because a Christian, when they enter into heaven, is headed towards wholeness. Is headed, headed towards restoration. The Christian is headed towards fullness. We're headed to a place where God will repair all that is broken. Let's go in verse 4 in Revelation 21, verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. You know, we're all missing something. Did you know that? Everyone who's walking around is missing something. Some of us are missing more somethings than others, but everyone is incomplete. Like, if we were all jigsaw puzzles, there'd be some people with the corners missing. Some, their core, right in the middle of the puzzle, is missing. Because we've, we've broken ourselves. We've broken ourselves and we've been broken against our will. It's just part of living in this world, this sinful world. We are broken. But God, in his sovereign might, in his sovereign strength, is in the process of restoring us. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is supernaturally working through the work of Jesus on the cross to restore what's been broken in you. And you will go your entire life with God restoring the brokenness in you. Now here's the thing. We'll never be fully complete. So we will die at some point on a higher like closer to restoration, and then we'll die, and then we will go to heaven. And when we go to heaven, God will completely restore all that was broken. 
God will completely restore all that was taken from us. Because this world has broken us. Are you familiar with the movie The Wizard of Oz? I mean, it's America. Of course you are, right? Uh, Dorothy, Tornado, we're not in. Any more Toto, Ruby Slippers. Dorothy spends the entire movie trying to get home, but she's not alone. First, she encounters a scarecrow, and then she encounters a tin man, and then she encounters a lion, and they're all missing something. The scarecrow is missing a brain. The tin man is missing a heart, and the lion is missing courage. And so they, they, they set out and they say, if we go to the wizard, he's going to make all these things happen for us. They are looking to become whole. When I was young, I thought that they were all trying to get home, right? And I thought, oh, that's what they need to get home. But they weren't trying to get home. They were looking for the part of them that was missing, right? Somebody's missing a brain. I know people like that. <laughs> Somebody's missing a heart or some courage, right? We're all incomplete. And, and, and they were looking to become whole. And so we, as we go along this life, we're all walking this yellow brick road pursuing wholeness and restoration in the same way. But here's the only thing. God is the only one that can restore those broken pieces. And for the Christian, God is the only one who can and will restore in our new destination. Now, right about now, you might be saying, Edmund, but why do I need God to do that? Like, I got myself into this. I made the decisions. I, I sinned. I broke things. Why can't I fix them? Listen, you guys are very capable people. Some of you, you set your mind on something and you accomplish it like you're just so driven, but you can never make yourself whole. The best you can do is treat an infected wound. The best you can do is convince yourself that you don't miss the missing part of you. But that's like an amputee convincing themselves they don't miss the missing limb. God will restore you. And as a Christian, that is what you're headed to. Because your new destination, if you are in Christ, if you're in the gospel, is wholeness. And heaven will be made whole. We're headed to a new destination that will be made physically and spiritually complete. Is that good? You'll be a complete resurrected person in heaven and spiritually you'll be made whole because there'll be no sin and you will be in fellowship with God forever the way it was supposed to be in the garden. So your new destination is a physical home. It is to be made whole by the living God. But that's not all because your new destination isn't just a place. Your new destination is a person. Your new destination is Christ. Your new destination is being united with a God who loves you. Your new destination is to be united with Jesus who died from you, for you. Revelation 21.3. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. There's another scripture that talks about this. As Jesus is being falsely accused and executed unjustly, he is on a mountaintop with two thieves, two criminals who are dying. One of those comes to faith in Jesus. And this is what Jesus says to that man. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. There are so many people who are at the end, close to the end, they need to know this. That when you have faith in Jesus Christ, that day, instantly, you will be with him. That we are headed towards Jesus. While it's good to have an eternal home in heaven, is anybody upset about an eternal home in heaven? 
No. While it's good to be physically and spiritually complete in heaven, I can't wait for that. The new destination is about uniting a believer with Jesus. That's what heaven is all about. That's what it's always been about. It's the opportunity for the believer to have a repaired version of what was broken at the Garden of Eden. It's the opportunity to be with God forever. And until we, that day, until we see him face to face, we are yearning for God. Our prayers are done in faith because God's invisible, right? So we pray to an invisible God. Our songs are done in faith because God's invisible. So we sing to an invisible God. And our prayers and our songs, they're yearning, they're a longing to be united with God face to face. Have any of you ever been in a long distance relationship? A long distance relationship. Maybe you're a boyfriend, girlfriend, and one of you went to a different school, right? Maybe, maybe you are, um, you're, you're, you're married and your spouse is stationed somewhere far for an extended period of time. Maybe in this new age of technology, and this is not bad, um, you met someone online, right? And you hit it off. And you've built a relationship with them. And maybe you're going to get married, which is great, but you live on different continents, right? There are some repercussions with having a long-distance relationship. Ever, anyone ever have one? No? You guys all married your next-door neighbor? Awesome. <laughs> it worked out. Fine. Like, if, like, even like, before technology, you had to wait for the postman and get a letter. You didn't know if you were broken up. You wouldn't find out if you were broken up for two weeks, right? <laughs> But now the world is smaller, and you have all these ways to, to, to nurture a long-distance relationship. You could get text messages, instant. You could send emails. You could send messages, instant messages. And, and then all the communication's great. I mean, you guys don't know this, like young people? Like, we communicate like the Jetsons now. You don't even know what that is. <laughs> but it's like screen to screen, face to face. You could do that now with a long-distance relationship, correct? But none of you, if you like the other person, would choose that over in-person fellowship, over in-person communication, because something would always get lost. In, in the letter, in the text, in the email, something would get lost. There's nothing like face-to-face -face communication. And that's how it is with us. We are in a long-distance relationship with God. Our communication, it is what it is. We pray and we read the Bible, and that's good. That's enough. But here's the truth. Until we talk to Jesus face to face, we're going to get a lot of this wrong. Like, I will read my Bible, and I'll get it wrong sometimes. I know. You can't believe that. <laughs> just, like, how could you, Edmund? You're just so right. I will read this with Edmund lenses, and I will get it wrong. But when I'm face to face with Jesus, I'll never get it wrong. There'll be times in my prayer and my communication that I get it wrong. God, you're telling me to do this. And he wasn't. There'll be times in my prayer and communication when I laxed, right? When I'm not even pursuing, right? But when I'm face to face, that'll never be the case. But, but Edmund, I have a great relationship with Jesus right now. I'm not waiting for that to then. Like, I have a great, anybody have a great relationship with Jesus right now? I got a lot of work to do unless I see more hands. I will lock the doors. Your relationship with God right now is good. You're pursuing God, you're listening to God, you're praying, but it's not the same thing as being face to face. It's not. Stuff you get is off. We already talked about it. It's like, a, like when everything was locked down and we did Zoom calls. You guys remember Zoom calls? Right? We did what we had to do. Right? We did them as a staff. We did them as elders. We did what we had to do. Right? We were just trying to figure everything out. But it wasn't the same as being face-to-face. -face. Like I couldn't strike fear in my staff's heart over Zoom. Right? 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 It's not the same. Anyway, so face-to-face is going to be better when we get there. Your new destination is Christ. As a Christian, you're headed to Christ, the Jesus who saved you. Okay, what do we do with this? These are facts on heaven. What do we do with them? 
Number one, keep focused on the road to get there. Keep focused on the road to get there. As we live this life, there are so many distractions, right? There are so many things that can take us away, right? And so we, we might pursue other things and forget where we're headed. I think one of, the, uh, one of the tragedies of the Christian church is that we only believe half of the gospel. It's not bad, but it's tragic. How about, so, so the gospel is Jesus Christ died for your sins. And if you're a Christian, you believe that. That's good, correct? Amazing. I love it. If you're a Christian, you believe that um, you are living a blessed life, that, that God's anointing your steps, correct? Okay. And this is the half that we forget, that we miss. And, 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 and there are repercussions for, for missing this, okay? I believe this is the, the birth of name it and claim it, um, prosperity gospels, because as a, some Christians forget where they're going. And so they try and live heaven here. But we've got to be focused on there, right? We got to be focused on there and not necessarily here. Let me tell you a truth, okay? If you're a Christian, this world, this road, to use that same analogy, is the closest to hell you're ever going to get, okay? So when they get your order wrong at Burger King, that's the closest to hell you'll ever get. It just gets better. But if you're not a believer, if you don't have the promise of your new destination, this world is the closest to heaven you'll ever get. And that's why they live in anxiety and fear. Every day has got to be perfect. Every meal has got to be perfect. Every picture has got to be perfect. Crop it. Because I don't have anything better after this. Remember, you're on the road and keep focused on how you get there. Number two, kind of the same. Remember where you are going. See, if we understood, if we kept our eyes on the road and we remembered where we were going, our lives would be different. I guarantee you, a Christian who understands, who has a good theology of end times and heaven, that Christian is more willing to be a missionary. That Christian is more willing to live like Jesus and give of themselves. Listen, I got 80 years on this earth, 60 if I don't start eating better, right? Right? If, if I think that these 60 years are the best that it gets, I am clinging to everything and I am living selfishly. But if I know where I'm going after this and it only gets better, then I can live selflessly, which is what God calls me to. I can give myself to you people. I can give myself to my wife and my kids and my community and my neighbors. Because I understand there's something after that is better. Like I don't have to spend every day trying to justify or trying to grasp at all I have here. Listen, I am blessed to have done a lot, right? I'm blessed to have seen the Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon's awesome. You guys should see it. But you know what happens if you don't see it and you are in faith? You know what's gonna happen? You get to see, I point to the sky, you guys say heaven. You guys are like, Mount Rushmore. I don't know. What are, we, what are we doing, Edmund? All right. You get to see heaven. And I guarantee you, heaven is better than the Grand Canyon. Like, you're not going to miss anything. Okay? So live a full life. But remember where you're going. And this is where this is applied. Because if you remember where you're going, you will make these days count. And you'll do it in the gospel. And here's the last one. Have hope when the road gets hard because you are headed in the right direction. Have hope when the road gets hard. Listen, this week there's been two deaths with people in the church and there's one more person I talked to yesterday who is on the verge of going home. Like this life is hard. And you guys tired? Yeah? This, this life is hard. This life is tiring. But if you know that you are headed in the right direction, you will have hope 
when the hard times come. Listen, we're human. We're not masochists. So when we face pain, when we face opposition, it's normal to stop. It's normal to go another direction, correct? But if we knew that this suffering was just a way to get us to our new destination, that this pain was just a temporary bump in the road, pothole, roadblock, to get us to where we wanted to go, then we would have hope in the hard times. Christians above all should be the most hope-filled people in these times. Because we know what happens after this. So what else can you do? You can have hope when the road gets hard because you're headed in the right direction. So how do you live this out? Keep focused on the road. Keep your eyes on the road. It's like you're the last driver on a road trip, right? You got the midnight to 3 a.m. shift. Everyone's asleep in the back. They hate you, right? You're the unlucky one who drew the, drew the, the short straw, so you got to drive. You can't fall asleep. Keep your eyes on the road. Remember where you are going. This is the application. I know where I'm going so I can sacrifice now. I know it's better. And then have hope. Listen, I talked about some people who are passing away. We're all gonna go through that door. But I know where I'm going after. And I know it's better. And some of you have loved ones who are in eternity already. And they had some hard days towards the end, maybe, medically, right? I'm going to tell you right now, they ain't having a hard day right now. They're only having good days. And that is the faith for those in the new destination. It started in a garden, and it'll end in a garden. As God completes the circle of redemption, remember that you have a part in that story. As a Christian, you're on a journey that will take you straight to him. I want to read to you this last scripture here. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the streets of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Let's pray. God, I am lifting up uh, to you those who have uh, lost loved ones this week or in the midst of losing loved ones who have faith in you. It is hard. But God, I pray that as you welcome home those who've died in the faith, you would comfort families who are left here. God, for any believer here who is living for this life, shake them, God. Open their eyes. How fragile this life is and how easily they can live to serve and then be rewarded forever in heaven. This is not what it's about. It's so much better. God, for anybody here who doesn't have this faith and wants it, wants a home, wants restoration, wants wholeness in you, give them courage today to come to faith in you. We live for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.